Watch this. Voters turning out in record numbers for Idaho's first mail-in election. But was it successful for election officials? Where's the love? That's what this woman wants to know. Boise's interim police chief says he knows where to find it, and we don't have to look very far. And what happens next after last night's Black Lives Matter vigil? I have some thoughts. We wouldn't typically begin a newscast with old news, something that has happened yesterday, but this isn't your typical newscast, and it wasn't your typical night in downtown Boise last night. What happened last night deserves more attention than just one news cycle. Look at this impressive aerial photo that we just got in from Boise police. They say they believe there were over 5,000 people gathered at the state house for last night's Black Lives Matter vigil. Next to the Women's March, this has got to be one of the largest ever, if not the largest gatherings at the state house. Now the vigil was to mourn the lives of black Americans lost at the hands of police. People from all walks of life stood silently as others stood at the podium sharing their stories, including some that left the crowd in tears. And for some, those tears continued to flow when the names of the victims were read aloud every 15 seconds, followed by a moment of silence. Eric Gardner, John Crawford III, Michael Brown, Azil Ford. Dante Parker, Michelle Cuso. He didn't deserve to die. I can't breathe. This is about George. Laquan Donald, George Mann. In the days leading up to this moment, I have been incredibly moved by the support of each of you and our community as a whole. Kanisha Anderson, Akaya Gurley. Those demonstrators, those protesters staying well into the night, chanting and marching through downtown, eventually ending back at the state house. As you just saw, no one was arrested. We also talked with the organizer of last night's vigil, and I want you to hear from her about why they held the vigil and what they hope to accomplish. We, we hope that our white allies leave um, with a greater sense of duty uh, to their brown brothers and sisters, um, and we hope that uh, people of color like myself feel heard, uh, feel listened to. I'm really looking for a, un a unity in our community and a way for um, all people of all colors um, to come together um, and mourn together and leave um, and wanting to join and bridge some gaps. Leave wanting to join and bridge some gaps. Her words echo what Boise City Councilwoman Lisa Sanchez said earlier this week on the 208 that it's not enough to participate in a vigil or protest and call it good and go home. Sanchez said that we should be asking ourselves, are you willing to stand up for every day for change when there's not a protest? It's not enough anymore to call it good and go home, just like it's not enough anymore to send out a press release or to make a statement on Twitter and be done. Governor Little has tweeted once about the death of George Floyd and its aftermath, and he's released one statement. Here's what he tweeted Tuesday. George Floyd's death is unacceptable. We can all unite around our demand for justice for this innocent man. I'm proud of Idahoans who have channeled their sorrow and anger in peaceful protest, and I appreciate mayors across Idaho who are helping to manage this situation. He went on, I pray for the safety of our citizens and our law enforcement officers. God bless George Floyd and the men and women who are standing up in peace for a fair and equitable criminal justice system in America. But this has become more than just fighting for a fair and equitable criminal justice system. This is about fighting for a fair and equitable life. Just last summer, 28 of our state's lawmakers sent a letter to Boise State President Dr. Marlene Trump urging her to stop diversity and inclusion efforts at Boise State. Those lawmakers called the school's effort disconcerting. 
And how many times has the Add the Word group petitioned Idaho lawmakers to update the state's Human Rights Act to ensure that it will protect all Idahoans, including gay and transgender Idahoans? They've tried 14 times, and every time legislators have said no. And just this spring, Idaho lawmakers passed a transgender sports ban that bans transgender student athletes from competing in sports consistent with their gender identity. Idaho lawmakers also passed a bill forbidding transgender Idahoans from changing the gender marker on their birth certificates. Governor Little has said that he thinks Idaho is a welcoming state to everyone and that people shouldn't be discriminated against for whatever they do. He had the opportunity to veto both transgender bills, but didn't. In my discussion with Boise City Councilwoman Lisa Sanchez, she said to really affect change, we should all ask ourselves, what are we willing to commit to? She said, we don't need social justice to be a trend, a selfie on your, your social media feed. It needs to be a commitment. So I asked Governor Little and all of our state legislators on both sides of the aisle and city leaders, all of us, what is your commitment now? Just send out a tweet and call it good? Or will you make a commitment to take action? Because I've always been taught that actions speak louder than words. But what are your thoughts? Text us your comments at 208-321-5614. I wanna hear from both those who agree or disagree because I wanna have a civil conversation about this. I'll share some of your comments at the end of the show. And I don't want you to think that I don't think there's any good happening in our state. I love our state. There is good all around us, which is why I wanted to share with you this. Prior to last night's vigil, Boise Mayor Lauren McLean held a news conference with Acting Police Chief Ron Weiniger, urging everyone to remain peaceful, which, as you saw earlier, they did. But standing off to the side of the news conference was a sign, one that caught the attention of Chief Weiniger and ultimately ours as well. Take a look. If I could make one last statement, uh, not to draw too much attention, but there's a sign here in the background that says, where is the love? And I would hope the answer to that is right here in Boise. Acting Chief Weiniger, I couldn't agree with you more. The answer is right here. A 208 viewer texted us wanting to know regarding the death of George Floyd, what would have happened if one of us would have stepped in to help him? When we see something like that happening, do we have the right to try to stop it, especially if it is wrong? It's a great question. So we called former Idaho Attorney General David Leroy for the answer to that one. He says it's a great question too. He says it's kind of complicated, but he says there are laws on the book that define attempts to obstruct or resist a police officer as a crime. So if you saw that and, and you felt compelled to step in, while morally it might be the right thing to do legally, you could be charged with resisting or obstructing an officer. If you don't follow police officers orders uh, or if you attempted to interrupt police conduct and that's a misdemeanor and punishable by up to one year in jail. Leroy also noted, though, that there's been a law on the books in Idaho since 1972 that says any officer who is guilty of willful inhumanity or oppression toward any prisoner under his care or in his custody is punishable by a fine of up to $5,000 and removal from his job. A historic turnout across the state for Idaho's first mail-in primary, but was it all smooth sailing? Have something you want to get off your chest? Maybe a question you've been wanting to ask? Well, get out your phone and text them to us. The number's on your screen. Make sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. We'll get to some of your text at the end of the show. Here are...
Results are now in for what has become a memorable 2020 primary election. You can find all the results right now at KTVB.com. The results this time around, though, they were almost a secondary story to how the election ran. For the first time ever, Idaho did the whole thing by mail. And now that it's said and done, because of the coronavirus, and now that it's said and done, how did it go? Are clerks ready to run it the same way for the much anticipated November election? Here's our Joe Paris. Certainly are happy to have this election behind us because it's been more of a marathon than most elections have been in the past. The 2020 Idaho May primary will forever be remembered as the one we did through the mail. Now that that process is over, how did it go? It was a long night, longer than we've had in quite some time. So we finished the night at about 4.30 is when we got the final results posted. Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain says while things ended up working out nicely, the road through the primary had plenty of challenges. We got about what I would say about two days notice to switch from our traditional polling place election to doing an all mail election. And that's really where it hurt us is we're not built. We don't have the infrastructure to run an election this way. And part of like the time it took last night is a reflection of us just not having the equipment and having the things we need to be able to do it in this manner. The good news at the clerk's office is there was historic turnout. Voters submitted just under 96,000 ballots in Ada County, beating the previous record of 79,000. McGrain tells me he always loves to see high turnout, and he believes that the state marketing the primary like never before really helped. Secretary of State's office uh, sent an absentee request to every registered voter. Normally, you don't see the state put so much money and energy into informing people that there's an election and making it easy to do it. To cut down on the workload on election night, Ada County staff had been working all day Monday and Tuesday processing ballots. But those last minute ballot submissions added a lot of work. It was that final stretch. It was all those ballots we received on the final day because they came in at the last minute. It was really a surge of results and then it took hours and hours to get those last 16,000 done. It's unclear exactly what the November general election will look like, but McGrain says they're already thinking ahead about specifics. I doubt that November is going to be an all-male election here in Idaho. I think there was some resistance initially to doing it. We'll see what the pandemic looks like at that point, and that may obviously drive decisions. Um, but I do think it'll be some hybrid. Already 70,000 people in Ada County have requested an absentee ballot for November. In terms of changes the clerk's office wants to make before the general election, McGrain says that over this summer, the office will be looking to improve their processes and also evaluate equipment needs. We issued uh, ballots that had some errors and we had to correct those and we got new ballots to all the voters, but we certainly felt the pain in this election in terms of needing to kind of tighten those things up so that we can make sure it just goes much more cleanly. Overall, McGrain says this was a valuable experience to set up the future of voting. This primary is really a good test for kind of the big show when it comes to November. Ada County, Idaho's most populated county, clearly ran into issues of processing just the pure volume of ballots. So what did it look like, Joe, in other counties? Were you able to check in with them? Yeah, I checked in uh, with some smaller counties, including Washington County. I, I spoke to the folks up there. and uh, A much smaller scale up in Washington County, the clerks up there telling me they're actually out the door pretty quickly before 10 o'clock. With that said, though, they admit that they have a lot fewer ballots to get through than Ada County. Uh, a big question heading into November, as we mentioned, will be what will the system look like? A hybrid system, uh, which Phil McGrain had mentioned there, would again involve a lot of people getting an absentee ballot. They're really seeing a lot of requests already, but they know there is that want uh, for people to go vote in person. It really just depends though what the pandemic looks like in the fall. Of course, Kim, there's concerns about another spike. It's kind of wait and see. Joe, I do agree with you. There is something about physically going to the polls to vote and, and getting your little sticker, but we're learning to do everything from home now, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything is really adapted. We kind of right. some experts say we fast forwarded decades ahead in terms of technology and processes. OK. All right. Joe Paris. Thank you. They're back. Why Washington state officials are warning the murder hornet could soon make a return to the Pacific Northwest. Have something you want to bring up with us? A question or a comment about today's show? Text us at 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag the 208.
Well, it's been a warm day and we still have a warm evening to enjoy, even though temperatures are already just starting to fall back just a touch from where we hit our highs earlier this afternoon. 82 in Boise and Nampa, 87 in Ontario. We've had a little bit more cloud cover out there through the day today than what was originally, well, what I originally expected yesterday. Uh, But tomorrow I think we'll have more sunshine than what we're seeing right now. It's kind of that milky, hazy appearance to the sky. All scattered showers and storms well to our east and continuing to move in that uh, direction. Skycam 7 showing that filtered sunshine, but this evening temperatures stay really comfortable. So if you've got a backyard fire pit, you want to have dinner outside, go for it. It is one of those evenings, one of those long summer evenings when the sun doesn't go down until 921. 54 to 59, very early tomorrow morning. Those are our overnight lows. And then tomorrow, again, a lot more sunshine than today. Temperatures very similar to where we were today as well. I think low to mid 80s through the Treasure Valley, the Magic Valley, Mountain Valleys looking at the low 70s. Now through yesterday, today, and tomorrow, three days that are very similar, we've been under a zonal flow, westerly flow aloft upstairs in our atmosphere that's kept our temperatures fairly moderate. We're still above average, but at least no big spikes in the heat. The spike comes on Friday as we switch that flow to come out of the southwest and that will really pump in the warmth. So we're taking temperatures up into the 90s on Friday. If you're not a fan of the heat, don't worry. It's just one day that you have to stay in the AC. 96 degrees is my forecast high for Boise. You see the record for the day? 97 in 2016. Now, we do have a few clouds that'll come through from time to time, but again, more sunshine to enjoy than cloud cover through the next couple of days. It's late Friday into Saturday that our scattered showers and storms arrive, and some of those storms could prove to be fairly feisty, maybe some strong wind. Uh, We'll have to keep a close eye on that timeline, especially if you you have camping plans, you're heading up into the mountains, That's something that we'll continue to keep a close eye on and update you as we move through the day. So it's a forecast to keep an eye on every day heading into the weekend with those big changes in play for us. Temperatures dropping 30 degrees from Friday afternoon to Saturday afternoon and even cooler on Sunday with more showers expected as we kind of even things out into the middle of next week. We'll be right back with the 208 after this break.
Well, we like to remind our viewers the 208 is a conversation that we want to hear what you have to say, especially if you have a question. Ask us and we will try to answer it like this one. Jerry asks, Kim, what is going on with the killer hornet story that I heard about? Well, Jerry, I've got good news for you. Uh, yeah, good and bad news. I don't know if you're going to like this one or not. Uh, <laughs> just looking at it, it makes my skin crawl. Two weeks ago, someone found a dead murder hornet, also known as the Asian giant hornet in Washington state. It was the first of its kind found in the state since the invasive species showed up in the U.S. late last year, meaning that it survived the Pacific Northwest winter, something officials had hoped wouldn't happen. Then last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture confirmed that hornet was a queen. Ooh, but there is some good news. If that queen started a nest, it will not survive without her. However, and that's a big however, the Washington State Department of Ag says murder hornet colonies can produce a few hundred queens, meaning there's likely more in the area. So 2020 just keeps on getting better, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, as promised, I want to keep the conversation going with some of your comments and you have been texting us. We appreciate it. Brock, we'll start off with you. You texted, I believe the loss of a life isn't easy, but where is the protest for all the officers that are shot and killed every year? Why are we so biased as a society for some and not others? Brock, that's a good point. Kathy texted us, Kim, what are what you are discussing is feeding evil. Transgenders, regardless of which avenue they lean, do not belong in all other gender activities. Kathy, I appreciate your comment. You don't have to worry. The governor signed the legislation into law. Another viewer wrote, letting a biological male compete against women is wrong. It has nothing to do with discrimination. Another viewer texted us, we need to quit referring to different nationalities by their nationality, instead by who they all are, instead uh, by who they all are, Americans. Drop the white and the black, we are all God's children. 
good point. Maybe dropping the color reference would help promote equality. Another person wrote us, all lives matter, move on. It's not about the color of your skin, wrote another viewer. It's supposed to be about police brutality. Kat, you sent us that one, and Kat said, thanks for your timely answer. And I do want to answer that one, Kat. Police brutality is a, a small problem of the bigger problem. Police brutality is how the problem is manifested. The problem is fundamentally racism and a system of injustice for people of color and for gays and transgenders. Marty says, as long as there is the current majority in our government, equality, better lives, less divisiveness, and a sense of being part of a progressive community will not be achieved. And then he said, thanks for listening. Mona, you texted us this one. We have lost our only black legislator until we elect more minorities. Idaho will never change. And Larry, you did not like my comments at all. You said, it's people like you fanning the flames that breed hate. Idaho is a pretty much conservative state where your liberal cohorts and other places are burning down their city. Keep your spew to yourself. We don't need your input. Larry, I, I don't see how talking about equality is fanning the fumes that breed hate. That's actually the exact opposite of what I'm trying to do. But thanks for watching and thanks for your feedback. Another uh, viewer texted us, the governor missed an important opportunity to stand for human rights, as has the legislature routinely. Bobby, you wrote us that one. So again, we appreciate you guys texting with us. That's the whole point of the 208. As, as I said at the top of the show, this isn't your typical newscast, and you're just as much a part of the show as we are. And we love to have this conversation, especially a civil conversation, about the issues that are important to our community and to Idaho. That's why we named it the 208. We'll be back tomorrow with more news. We hope you'll join us then.